Well, thank you for that warm welcome. Um, I, sh I should start out by saying that um, I feel a bit of a forward standing here because I don't think I'm a great thinker about brands. You're not going to get an academic treatise or a whole set of new insights into branding. What I am is a practitioner who's spent most of their working lives working on brands where the brand promise is altruistic, nebulous, or delayed, and where that brand promise is ultimately dependent upon trust. I want to spend a few minutes talking about which. I want to do that not just because I'm immensely proud of our organization and what it does, which I am, but also because I think it exemplifies my arguments. The successful delivery of the brand promise is not static, but a continuous process of incremental innovation. That brands have to continuously improve as competition means that areas of previous competitive advantage rapidly become merely things you have to do. That failure here can be completely disastrous. That consumers look to brands increasingly to do something greater in their lives. And here you enter the world of altruistic, nebulous, and delayed trust, the, world, the delayed benefit, the world of trust. This is Witch's vision statement, which exists to make individuals as powerful as the organizations they have to deal with in their daily lives. And I think the thing I want to draw out of this is this doesn't say which tests products better and more independently than anyone else, which is what you might expect it to say. Which has evolved its brand promise and says, actually, it's more than that. That actually, we should do independent scientific testing. It's great, it's important we do that. But also, the which plays a broader role in people's lives too. It does a wide range of things. It guides people on the decisions they have to make. And those decisions range from buying a, a toaster to which care home is suitable for my elderly parents. It campaigns for changes in markets that aren't working properly for consumers. And increasingly, it tries to fix broken markets where competition is not driving the improvements that consumers need. And we do it by entering those markets as commercial players and to try to change the markets from within. Last year, I, I went across to Washington as part of the negotiations on the EU-US trade deal and had the pleasure of meeting Max Baucus, who was at the time the chair of the Senate Finance Committee to discuss the deal. And I explained what this, this concept, the changing markets from within. And his reaction was, what kind of subversive capitalists are you guys? And I quite like that, the idea that which is a subversive capitalist. This is the cover of the first Witch magazine in 1957 a somewhat curious one. It was an edition on kettles, kettle testing. The traditional brand promise that that exemplified was about the consumer need for rigorous, independent test, scientific testing to aid the right purchase. And that independence was always key, which has not taken advertising to its history. And that's because it believed in 1957 that that was part of a process that was bad for the consumer in making independent scientific choices. It doesn't take money from government. It doesn't take money from trusts and foundations. All the money that which has to spend on its charitable work comes from the sale of goods and services in the marketplace. And this evolved into the testing of an extraordinary range of items over the last 50 years. Kettles, toasters, TVs, washing machines, all of those you're probably familiar with, but ones you may not really realize we've tested. Paper dresses in the 1960s, Condoms, dog food, baby milk, gold, IFAs. We now test more than 3,500 products and services a year and have had over 450,000 responses from consumers to our surveys at the same time. And to evolve its brand promise, to go beyond that original core brand promise of independent scientific testing, which has done a number of things. Yes, we still advise people on what to buy, but increasingly we also advise on how to get the best from it. One of my favorite things is a widget on the website where you can type in your TV brand model and you can actually see a back of your TV and it says, 
you're an idiot, but stick the, DV, the Blu-ray player in here, stick the satellite player in, satellite dish in here, and so on. That's the kind of thing, not just buy it, but how do you actually enable it to happen properly? And not just testing of products, but testing of services too. Home insurance, care homes, IFAs, all the things you need that aren't the traditional products that we all know and love. And the final evolution of the story so far, and one I think is increasingly important, is about helping with life decisions. I mentioned care homes, but there's a whole range of them I'll come on to in more detail. University education, you know, when you have your first baby, going to university, all those things that are important decisions where consumers need support and where they're looking around for trusted brands to intermediate for them. And this evolution is about taking that core brand promise and evolving it over time to become something different, something more meaningful. The consequence of this, the benefit for us, if you like, is that we've been enabled to grow our subscriptions over the last 10 years to now be the largest circulation monthly magazine in the UK, up from some 800,000 10 years ago to 1.4, 1.5 million today. It's the largest subscription magazine in Europe. Um, we, last year, we overtook Saga. The re our revenue has also grown ahead of the publishing industry. The same period, we've grown by 52%. The average for the industry was 19%. Our prices have risen over that 10 years in line with inflation, not more. But crucially, only in the last five years have we seen the commercial benefit, that gain, coming from five years of investing in the evolution of the brand promise. But the which story doesn't end there. Because we don't just take that income, we have no shareholders, we don't take that income and distribute it to our shareholders. We use it to increase our campaigning and lobbying activity. We've increased that sixfold over the course of the last 10 years. And these are some of the things that we've been involved in. Right back in 2005, endowment mis-selling, misleading claims on food, pension reform, and that's a good example of a brand in it for the long haul. Those reforms that came to fruition in the budget, in the last budget, removing the pernicious compulsion to buy an annuity that had kept the annuity market so uncompetitive for so long. Estate agent supervision, trying to make estate agents behave like human beings when dealing with the greatest purchase we ever make. Legal services reform, I won't say much about that because there are lawyers in the audience tonight. PPI mis-selling, I might say more despite the fact there are bankers in the audience tonight. Credit card surcharges. Why should I have to pay more for selling by buying by a credit or debit card than it costs the company to actually process the transaction? One of my favorite letters was one from Travelodge during that campaign, where they said, but if we can't charge people a premium for, for paying by credit card, we can't sell a, a room for £25 a night, to which I wrote back and said, you're not selling a room for £25 a night. You're selling it for £25 plus £5 as a surcharge. But I think that's an example for me where actually there was a trust deficit going on. People actually started to become aware that they were being gouged by companies who actually weren't quoting the true cost of a service. Energy, the, the UK's first collective energy switching campaign. Banking reform, to try to get the culture of banking changed and actually start serving its customers and its society rather than purely serving bankers. And then the campaign most recently has led to changes in nuisance calls and texts. I've certainly noted a decline in a number of people telling me I've had an injury at work and how I could possibly claim, again, apologies to the lawyers in the audience, but that those were becoming such a, an intrusion into the lives of ordinary people. And finally, that third set where I talked about which intervening commercially in markets to try to fix them according to our values. It's a whole of market, fair treatment of customers. For example, our mortgage broking service. We, rec we do whole, as much whole of market as you can. We recommend all mortgages regardless of whether we get paid for recommending that mortgage. And the purpose of this, the purpose of going into these markets is to say these are ones that spectacularly fail consumers. They fail them for a number of reasons. One of them is a lack of competition, but they are failing consumers. So we want to show that you actually can go in as a commercial player, deal fairly with the consumers, and yes, then make a fair return. And if we can do it, why don't other people? The consequence of all this over the last 50 years 
has been the extraordinary levels of trust in which. Trust amongst the general public at 72%, amongst members of over 90%. Trust not just to do what it already does, but trust to actually get involved in areas way outside its normal core competence, like mortgage advice. But as you can see down at the bottom there, which isn't rated very highly for fun, and by now in this talk you may be seeing why. <laughs> this is some recent research from Havas on the role of companies in society. And as you can see, the post-war erosion of the belief that governments can solve all our problems has been accompanied by a rapidly increasing belief in the role of business and brands. So 86% of people think business, think government, is accountable for improving quality of life, but 85% think businesses are too. And that's up 15% since 2010. A massive increase over such a short period of time in who people are looking to to improve their quality of life. But as you can see from the same research, business as a whole is falling short. So if you look at the things that are quite traditional, value for money, quality, all very fine, fine and dandy. But helping stay healthier, third for consumers, they rate businesses ninth in that respect. Behaving honestly and transparently, fifth to fifteenth. Help me manage my spending, eighth to consumers, eighteenth for how businesses are actually performing. In other words, they are not delivering on the promises that people are looking for, that they can deliver something beyond a traditional brand promise. And perhaps as a result of that, across the developed world, people have lost faith in their brands. From the same research, according to consumers, only 5% of brands in Europe are improving their quality of life. And only 7% of brands would be missed if they disappeared. What is it about the developed world that's saying that? If you look across you know, Europe, 7% would be missed if they disappeared. In Asia, 51% would be missed if they disappeared. There's something going on here in Europe about how brands are perceived by their consumers. And I believe that that is one of the key reasons why which is thriving. That is addressing not just the core brand promise, but it is not just relentlessly, incrementally improving on that every year, but it's also confronting the wider issues that people want to see business as a whole address. Healthier food choices. Where can my partner give birth with, if they don't want to have a cesarean operation? How can I actually get through the home moving process with less, less stress? How do I help my son choose the right university? I need to find a care home for an elderly relative. Where can I go to the, find that, the best care home for them? What's this about the renewable heat incentive, ground source heat pumps, solar panels, all the rest of it? And how can I find a good installer? How can I manage my finances? What are my rights as a tenant? Those are all issues that if you go on the WITCH website, you can find answers to all of that. All of that, in fact, is free advice that's available to everyone, a WITCH member or not. And I believe that that is one of the key things we've got here, that which has actually managed to evolve in a way as addressing things that people look to brands as a whole to address. There is, however, still hope. There's still, even in the UK, a residual unmet need for brands and a belief that they can fill a gap that people feel persists in their lives. Even in the UK, that bottom right-hand corner, 49% of people believe that brands can play a role in improving my quality of life. It's just that, right now, most brands aren't actually doing it. This is on the energy sector. Just about every brand in the energy sector is failing to deliver against their core promise or to address the wider desires consumers have. Extraordinary low levels of customer satisfaction, even worse than the high street banks. In our last customer satisfaction survey, no energy company scored higher than any financial services brand. You've got to really try hard to do that. <laughs> Unprecedented levels of complaints. Trust down at the levels of politicians and journalists, not company that most of us want to keep. An ingrained scepticism 
that they're on their customer's side or doing what they can to address concerns such as the environment. If you look at that chart, the first thing that consumers say they want out of their energy company is it listens and cares about our customers. And they rank, the, it, they see it as the 21st thing on the mind of the energy companies. It treats me with respect. They want to see third. They think it ranks 23rd. Is open and transparent, fourth, 27th. Of all the things I see of sectors, and this includes banking, by the way, I haven't seen charts that show how an entire sector is so spectacularly failing to deliver what its customers want. So what can brands do, finally, to be on the right side of this divide? Well, I think relentless delivery against that core brand promise, but not in a static way, rather constantly showing the consumer a new way that core promise can be delivered. Helping consumers to find your brand meaningful by recognizing what you can do to contribute to their broader lives. And you can do this in a range of ways. People are fine about that. You might help them live more healthily, live more sustainable lives. You might guide them in, impartially through life's decisions. Or you might simply be a good citizen and pay your taxes. And in so doing, start on that slow, painful, and desperately fragile journey of building trust. Thank you.